A Pokemon battle is art. Be it the games, the anime, the manga, a well-done climactic battle can completely set one piece of media apart from the crowd. And ironically enough, Pokemon Legends Arceus, the game notorious for its lack of battles, is the game that executes this better than any other. This is how Pokemon crafted the perfect battle. Part 1 of constructing any good conflict, the core if you will, starts with a brilliant antagonist. Apart from Pokemon Black and White and some spin-offs like Coliseum and Mystery Dungeon, Pokemon has been surprisingly hesitant to end games off with a battle against a villainous character. Generally, every core game ends with an honorable battle between two of the region's greatest trainers and a competition to see who is truly the best. But that's not the case here. So, who is the man behind this epic conflict? Well, if you've played the game, you already know. The seemingly insignificant traveling merchant, Volo. Volo is a Latin term for I want, I wish, or I desire, according to Google Translate. Volo is merely a curious salesman who desires to know more about his world, investigating ruins at every chance he gets. When one day he learns about the existence of a higher power, Arceus. Believing himself to be the only one who knows of Arceus' existence, he strives to meet and conquer it one day, and takes his first step by seeking out the Pokémon banished by Arceus itself, Giratina. As Giratina rips open a hole in time and space, causing chaos across the Hisui region, Volo continues his investigation, using the main character as a means of gathering all the plates. After all, if you don't have protagonist plot armor, you'd never make it past Avalug alive. And even then, you probably wouldn't do it on your first try. For a majority of the game, Volo poses as a helpful ally, calling you his best customer, even though he never actually sells you anything. But really, more than anything else, being a longtime Pokemon fan helps disguise his betrayal. It's a well-known fact that a majority of the characters in this game are ancestors of current day characters. And then there's just Ingo. While some are drastically different from their descendants, like Azeru and Silene and... well mostly a Zeru. Many of the characters act similar enough to their descendants to where your mind can easily project personality traits of the descendants onto their ancestors. In a bizarrely backwards way. In a completely foreign and strange world, our brains tend to latch on to elements of familiarity, which is why I believe the ancestors are so deliberately similar looking to the characters we already know. And this design philosophy works perfectly in masking Volo's true nature. Many of us know his descendant Cynthia as one of the most knowledgeable and upstanding Pokémon trainers in the series. So with Volo expressing interest in Hisuian mythology and being on your side for a majority of the game, it's difficult to not see him as an extension of Cynthia's character, even though there are subtle hints to Volo's character greatly contrasting with Cynthia's. There is one Pokémon that Volo uses throughout the game in every battle, who could very well be seen as his ace. Togekiss. This Pokemon is also a part of Cynthia's team in Platinum, so it's easy to write this off as just a repeat, but consider that Togekiss, a fairy flying type, is the complete opposite of Cynthia's ace, Garchomp, a dragon ground type. In a twist of irony, the user of the ferocious Garchomp is a defender of worlds, and the user of the gentle Togekiss is a destroyer of worlds. And we know that Togekiss is an incredibly rare Pokémon that only reveals itself to peaceful lands, which Volo seeks to create much like Cyrus does in modern-day Sinnoh. Now, sure, it's easy to write off this whole Togekiss point as one giant coincidence, but seeing how detail-oriented Legends Arceus is when it comes to implementing Pokédex lore, I firmly believe this was an intentional hint planted in the game as far back as the first battle. It's not the only time this has ever happened, either. There are several instances throughout the series of trainers' ace Pokémon reflecting their own character traits, but perhaps the most cleverly planted hint is with the introduction of Kogita, presumably Cynthia's other ancestor. Kogita's name is derived from the famous phrase, Kagato ergo sum, or I think, therefore I am, in contrast to Volo ergo sum, or I desire, therefore I am. These conflicting philosophies are the defining traits that ultimately separate Volo from Kagita and Cynthia. The culmination of all these things is why I think Volo's betrayal is the most impactful twist that a Pokemon game has ever had. 
<clears throat> except for anything in Mystery Dungeon. Or at least better than that one where the guy with a Dorito-shaped head and an angry expression reveals that he's the leader of Team Flair. Man, how was I ever gonna figure that one out? Even if Volo's betrayal does become increasingly obvious as the post-game progresses, I'd say it's still well-masked enough during the main game to where it feels earned. When he name-drops Arceus and Giratina in a few late-game conversations, though, you get the vibe that he knows a little too much to just be an average merchant. But nonetheless, when the reveal finally drops its spear pillar, it does so in dramatic fashion. Not only does he unveil the DRIP, but flashbacks of your numerous childhood thrashings from Cynthia flood your mind as the iconic piano theme begins to play. As he sends out Spiritomb, you soon realize this isn't Cynthia's team. This isn't even Cynthia's music. This was all Volos from the start. And it was also the moment that I realized that my last Cynthia video was going to age very poorly. While the battle theme conveys the same grandiosity and dread that Cynthia's does, this one has an oddly light and whimsical tone to it, almost as if it's reflecting your own confused emotions in the light of this twist. More than anything, it conveys that this is it, this is the finale of the game, but it also hides something deeper. And at the end of this grueling 6 vs 6 fight, that something deeper finally comes to the surface. Pop off into Get Bodied is a combo I thought only existed in competitive fighting games, but lo and behold, I suppose it can happen in Pokemon too. Unlike other fights in the series that use more than six Pokemon, like Grievel in Gale of Darkness or Getsus in Black 2 and White 2, there is no free healing between these battles. Unless you are drastically overleveled, this is not a fight that you're going to win on your first go around. Or second. Or maybe even your 12th. Giratina will almost always get the first move, and you better pray to Arceus that it isn't Shadow Force, or you'll be fighting against something that's even more terrifying than a legendary Pokémon. RNG. You see why Hisui and Zoroark is a good Pokémon now? But finally, after several tedious attempts to take down both Volo and Giratina, it's over. Oh no, oh my god, what is happening? No, this is too much! With an explosive entrance and a drastic crescendo of a brilliantly remastered Giratina battle theme, a theme the composer Jinichi Masuda once crowned as his magnum opus, you know that the true battle has only just begun. In what can only be described as the rawest transition in Pokemon history. After 25 years, we are finally about to behold the awesome power of these Pokemon called Legendary. Not only will Giratina become faster to take full advantage of the Agile vs. Strong style battle system, but all of its stats will be raised and it will take even less damage from conditions like Poison and Frostbite. Almost as if the game is saying, you will not easily cheese your way through this confrontation. Directed by the same guy who did Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, by the way, he got tired of y'all saying Necrozma was easy. And finally, after being faked out twice, it's over. Like, actually over this time. Normally, after any other climactic fight, the game would just end. But there is a reward this time. The Azure Flute, an item that I think many of us never thought would see the light of day. Created in 2006 with Diamond and Pearl, but never released to the public, this sacred item is more mythical than some mythical Pokémon are. And even if you aren't able to immediately go and face Arceus, very few times obtaining an item has filled me with such a large sense of satisfaction. That's what makes this battle so special. Presentation. From the start to even when it's completely over, the entire spectacle is superbly delivered. The betrayal, the music, the absurd difficulty of the fight, and the prestigious award. All perfectly glued together by some of the greatest looking cutscenes ever seen in a Pokemon game. It all culminates in one of the most fantastic, high-energy fights that we've ever seen. 
The ramifications of this battle extend even into the future. When the protagonist defeats Volo and subsequently tames Giratina, this may have changed the entire course of events of Pokemon Platinum. After all, who ultimately stops Cyrus from reshaping the world as Volo wanted? It's not Dawn, it's not Lucas, it's not even Cynthia. It's Giratina, who previously was Volo's ally. It's very possible that this conflict is what changed Giratina from the demon of the Pokemon world to its savior. For years, I firmly believe that two battles would never be topped. Fighting Red atop Mount Silver, the incarnation of yourself from the previous game, and fighting N in his castle with a duel between the two legendary dragons. But in my humble opinion, this easily tops both of those. But as with anything, I do know that this fight has its fair share of critics. Some say the flaws of the new battle system are on full display here, with the scales being so heavily tipped in Volo's favor due to his incredibly fast and destructive team, leading to a fight that often results with you and him trading one-shot blows as you constantly counterpick against each other. But I think that's by design. It can result in rather frustrating outcomes, but the battle almost plays out like an elaborate chess match, trying to find the best possible route to the king, Giratina, while losing as few pawns as possible. Then he scores a critical hit and it feels like a chainsaw just went flying through the chessboard. Oh well, chalk it up to bad luck and try again. I would certainly like an element of prediction put back into the fight though, rather than turns going back and forth. I can't tell you how many times I switch my Samurai to Zoroark thinking, oh yeah, he's gonna close combat and I'll be a genius for switching. But then he clicks crunch and I die! For a moment there, I thought Volo turned into Diavolo, and he was just reading into the future, but then I realized, oh, okay, he just gets a turn when I switch. So, yeah, the battle system's not perfect. What are you gonna do? But for what they have specifically crafted for this game, I think it's the best demonstration they could have offered. At the very least, even if you hate the battle system, it's designed to keep the fight relatively close so that you can't just set up with one Pokemon and curb stomp him like a lot of other bosses. Ultimately, that was the whole point of this fight, to be as ridiculously hard as they could make it, and in that department, I think they succeeded. Pokemon Legends Arceus is not a perfect game, after all, no game is. Except NASCAR 2005 Chase for the Cup, obviously. But I do think this game created the closest thing to a perfect Pokemon battle. A legendary clash we certainly won't forget about anytime soon. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more videos like this one. I'll see you guys next time.